and welcome to Butterfly Monitoring. This presentation is an introduction. My name is Ermi Wilcoxon and I'm one of the co-coordinators for the program for Texas. First we'll talk about the program and give a brief introduction. Then I'll talk about choosing a route as well as communicating your chosen route to the other co-director who will set it up in a database, how and when to survey, a little bit about identifying butterflies, how to get support, and a task list for new monitors. Note that in this presentation I will use walk to indicate traveling along the route. Whether you're walking or rolling doesn't matter as long as you're going at a slow and steady pace. Recording means that you're collecting data, whether you are writing it down on the paper form or actually entering it into Pollard Base. Warm month indicate times when the average daytime temperature is at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a citizen science project started in cooperation with the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network. Using long-term monitoring, we can figure out whether a particular species is becoming more or less abundant, which species are using a particular habitat, and therefore how to make habitat improvements in places when, where one can support butterfly conservation. As a note, Texas has more butterfly species than any other state. Now choosing a route is up to you. Usually it's best to pick a route that is close to where you live or work or otherwise volunteer. It should take it between 30 minutes to 2 hours to walk at a slow pace. Have a well-defined path, whether it be mowed grass, gravel, paved, boardwalk, or any combination of those. It has to be accessible to, to the volunteer throughout the warm month. Note I didn't say accessible to the public. Private property can and should be monitored so that if you only have access to that property, that's okay. It should have at least one natural habitat. And preferable, but not required, can be walked in a circle because you're supposed to monitor each habitat only once during a particular survey. It's most efficient to walk in a circle. Here's the example I've chosen. This is the route I walk frequently enough. This is a detention pond in Houston called Willow Waterhole. It has a natural edge and a habitat island. The first habitat is near the road, and I've called that roadside. Many skippers, in fact, use the roadside habitat as part of their life cycle because they have grasses as their uh, host plant. Then there are hilltop areas here and here, which are indicated by being close to the apartments and on the other side here you can't see it but there's a shell plant that is located there. Hillside goes down the hill or up the hill. Then we have man-made bridges, two of those, and the island in between. Now some questions you might ask yourself about a possible route, something that you have in mind. First of all, is it accessible when I want to monitor? So that goes back to some areas are only accessible during certain parts of the year or on certain days. Uh, does it have multiple habitats? It doesn't have to, but if it has more, ha more than one habitat, it's more fun to monitor. Do a lot of people use this area? And am I okay with that? So that's a question as to whether you want to be out in nature by yourself or you feel more comfortable in a park-like setting where you have lots of people around. Either is okay. It's just something to think about. And of course, safety. Is it safe for me during the day? That is a question you should be able to answer by talking to other people and kind of using your own common sense. Communicating your chosen route to the co-director is detailed in the Creating a Route with Google Maps guide. When should you survey? Preferably at least eight times per year. At least four times before July 15th and four times after July 15th. 
on days when it is at least 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Although the ideal weather is sunny and little wind, I've seen many butterflies when it's been partly cloudy, mostly cloudy, and slightly windy. Butterflies are most active between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., but when the temperature rises to like 102, sometimes it's better to start a little earlier before 10 o'clock and end maybe a little later uh, after 4 o'clock because it's just too hot to be out. That's a decision that you can make. Now this is a big one. Only one person can look for butterflies. A second person can be a scribe, so there should be no more than two people work walking that survey route at any one time. If you're by yourself, then you are both monitor and scribe. If you have a partner, then you decide who's the monitor and who's the scribe, and that should ideally remain constant through the season. Walking at a steady pace is super important because one of the metrics that we will calculate is butterflies per minute. So having a steady pace is really important. Now your survey area is like being in the center of a clear sphere extending 20 feet in all directions. What that means to me is that I'm looking side to side, forward, as well as above me as I walk along. Now above me is not particularly critical if you're surveying a prairie type habitat. However, if you have a lot of shrubs and or trees as part of your habitat, those are areas that you want to look up as well as out because there are some butterflies that actually have trees as their host plants. So they may be spending time on those leaves in those trees. And so you want to be able to find those as well. Now, when you're recording your data while walking, you'll be using a paper form that I've sent to you in an email. Recording the start, end, and break times are critical. You'll notice that I've actually recorded the break time using hash marks, so I can um, just simply count those and put in the number of minutes for a break. Other people record the start time and the end time of the break. You can note unusual or changing conditions in the comments section. Although this is not required, it can be somewhat helpful. And then you, you'll use tally marks to record butterflies in the appropriate habitat. So for example, on this survey, there was an unknown sulfur in habitat D, which is hillside, I also saw some serenius blue, as well as common buckeye. You'll note that in my survey form, I've left spaces for unknown sulfurs. And yes, I have three lines because sometimes I see a lot of sulfurs. I've also entered a checkered skipper and an unknown skipper because these are species that I see very often. And often in quantity. So it's very easy for me to just write those down. Other species I may not may see one month and not the next month. So I write them in by hand. Now, keep your data forms. Although you'll enter data online into what's called Pollard Base, the database that we use, it's vitally important that you keep your original data forms. So, for example, if your route has not been established in Pollard Base, you can still monitor and record data. As a matter of fact, after you're done with training and you've established your, and you have selected your route, I should say, and sent it to the co-director, go off and monitor. Don't wait for the co-director to get back to you and say, hey, it's been established in Pollard Base. You can go ahead and monitor. That's just fine. You can enter the data once the route has been established in Pollard Base. But also, very importantly, if there's a question about your entry, you can go back to the form and check that. As far as I'm concerned, whatever you write down in the field is the truth. So when there's a discrepancy between what's on your paper and what's in the computer, which you entered at another time, 
What's on the paper trumps? Politbase relies on accuracy, not precision. So it is better to record a butterfly as an unknown hair streak than to guess and get it wrong. Especially people new to butterfly monitoring will have many entries such as unknown something, even unknown butterfly. That's okay. Better to call it unknown than to guess and get it wrong. You will become more comfortable identifying the most common species you see along your route, and you'll be able to spot field marks that will help you find others in your field guide. Now, details on how to enter your data are in a separate presentation. A bit about identifying butterflies. Some of you will have a lot of experience identifying butterflies, others not so much. So I've put down some of the most important things that I look at when I try to identify a butterfly. Size, shape, flight habit. Does it fly quickly? Does it fly slowly? Does it settle down? Or is it pretty much always in motion? Does it perch with wings open or closed? Some species perch with wings open almost exclusively. Others perch with wings closed almost exclusively. And some flap their wings. Of course, color. Color of the upper wing surface, color of the wing underside. Color and markings of wing margin, that's actually pretty critical for telling some butterfly species apart. And body color, which is often very hard to find. The way I like to identify butterflies is to look first, photograph next, and then look again. That is, of course, if the butterfly is still enough for you to do that. So. Spend a few moments looking at the butterfly. And in your head or out loud, Check off the size, shape, color, any markings that stand out to you. Check your guide. Compare it to the butterfly. By this time, the butterfly may have left, but you may or may not have identified it at this point. If you can get a few pictures, that's great. Then look again. Look at the wing margins, look at the body color, look at the antennae. That'll all give you additional information that will help you narrow down your species. Now, let's talk about butterflies versus moth versus grasshoppers. Depending on where you're monitoring, day flying moth may be rare or very common. The area that I monitor has very few day flying moth, and they clearly look like moth. Other areas I've seen have lots and lots of day flying moth. And you have to look a little more closely to tell that these are not butterflies. In general, moths fly faster, more directly from one place to another. Most of them are drabber, mostly grays, whites, and browns. The exception I show you is this one here on the right, which is a white tipped black. Now, you'll notice it is resting with the wings open, and it does not flap its wings when resting. Also, what's very clear in this picture are those fuzzy antennae, and that's a hallmark of moth. Butterflies have what's called a club antenna, which just means it's a stalk with a thickening at the end. Grasshoppers, on the other hand, often make noise when they fly. They fly in an arc from ground up in the air back to ground, and usually they land with kind of a plop. They tend to fly shorter distances, and most, though not all, grasshoppers tend to be greenish or brownish. Taking pictures for butter of butterflies for identification. Now, if you're a photographer, bear with me. This is for those of us who simply walk along, see a butterfly, want to take a picture, and grab their phone. If possible, get down close to the ground or flower or grass where the butterfly is resting. Importantly, do not let your shadow fall across the butterfly. They tend to notice that and leave. Take lots of pictures, as, as you can. 
It's often hard to tell in the field which image will show the field markings you can use to identify a butterfly or to exclude some species. I've taken pictures of one time seeing a skipperling, which is just the size of the tip of your thumb. It is the smallest butterfly. And the only reason I was able to tell that it was a southern skipperling was because one of my pictures showed the wing underside, which is the distinguishing mark. Southern skipperlings have a pale stripe on the underside of the wing, whereas orange skipperlings do not. Otherwise, the pictures were no great shakes, as you can see on the right here. So, amazing pictures are amazing, but not required for positive ID. Often poor quality images show the identifying marks and not much else. As a matter of fact, the picture on the right is not even really in focus. Now, however, from this picture, you can get a positive ID. Now, some butterflies don't cooperate with photographers no matter how skilled they are. In the Houston area, sulfurs and swallowtails are very difficult to photograph. We have a number of sulfurs that are, I would all classify as small sulfurs. They're about the same size. Unknown sulfur is a perfectly good entry in that case, which is why I use that quite a lot. Unknown swallowtail, unless you're able to see the wing markings, oftentimes they're not sitting still at all. And I can't really get a good read on that. So unknown swallowtail, again, is a good, is a good answer. I use iNaturalist after getting home. I do not use it in a field because it takes time away from actually monitoring. Uploading your observation to iNaturalist, uploading your picture, will produce a machine-generated species suggestion. Oftentimes, it's right on, especially if your picture is reasonably clear. But if the IDs, if the top two or three species suggestions are all possibles for the picture I took, then I don't accept an ID unless at least one user agrees with me and the machine. Um, there are many very experienced users on iNaturalist, and they will try to help you out with an ID, even if iNaturalist comes back with something that doesn't probably make sense. The other thing that though with iNaturalist that's really super helpful is the species suggestions are not geographically limited. In other words, you may get a species suggestion for a butterfly that is only seen in Canada or only seen in Mexico. So you can check on the map and see other people have seen this particular species. And if it's never been seen in your area, okay, you might be the first. But you might also question your ID and maybe look at some other IDs, closer to a related species or something that looks like it, um, to see what you have. If you do end up having something where you're just not super clear, it's not super clear, feel free to reach out to Bug Guide. They also have a lot of experienced uh, volunteers that help with that. Uh, you can also send me an email at, at Butterfly Monitors Texas and I can provide you an opinion. Uh, sometimes I have exper more experience looking at field markings and I may be able to find the butterfly for you um, that a naturalist was not able to find. So how to get support? First, please do your homework. Review the presentations and the materials that we've given you. If you still have concerns or questions, do send an email to butterflymonitorstexas at gmail.com, but make sure that you put your concern, your question, in the subject line. If it is about butterfly ID, put that in your subject line. If it is about how to get a route going or route related issues, put that in your subject line. If your question, if your 
wondering whether your route has been established in Pollard Base? Put that in your subject line. We will do our best to get back to you within three days. However, we as the three co-directors have split up the tasks. So using the right subject line will make sure it gets to the right person, the person that can actually answer your question or concern or help figure out what's going on. Now, lastly, here's a task list so that you have something to refer back to. Create your account on iNaturalist if you haven't already done so. It's optional, but super helpful. Make sure you have a field guide for your region's butterflies, something that you can actually carry with you. Create a Pollard Base account. Go to pollardbase.org and create a new account. New accounts have to be approved by a director. I will be going into Pollard Base frequently to check on uh, new volunteers and make you active. Select and submit your route. See the creating a route with Google Maps for details. And then get out, sir. Get outside, observe, and enter data into Pollard Base. Thanks for your attention. Hope to see you around.